Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here with my good friend, Don Tapscott, is joining us from... Are you, where are you? Are you in Toronto, Don? I'm in Toronto, yeah. I'm yeah. in this uh, cool building. I just moved in here. It's called the Mars uh, Discovery District. It's uh, <laughs> got about 800 entrepreneurs in one building. I love it. Different companies, yeah. Don is the author of Macro Wikinomics, Wikinomics, a number of wonderful books. And, you know, we've known him... Uh, for a long time, uh, it, you know, I consider it a privilege uh, to uh, have talked to Don many times, uh, and is an expert on uh, our changing world, um, and is doing a CBC series right now on the radio uh, in Canada, which will soon be on NPR in the U.S. and uh, other places, um, called Re-Civilization. You've done how many episodes now? Four episodes, Don? Yeah, we've got four down. There's uh, one more to go. They're each one-hour radio episodes. And what do you mean when you say re-civil? Oh, and I invite, by the way, everybody to join us because we want to. We, what we want to do with this is have you uh, talk to Don uh, and ask questions. And uh, so the way we're going to handle that, we have our usual chat room at irc.twit.tv, but we also have open uh, a cover it live um, instance on the CBC Civilize, Recivilization page. That's cbc.ca slash recivilization. Uh, so you can join us there. And uh, Don's producer, Adam Killick, is also uh, on with me. And he has a back channel. And we're also following it on Twitter with the hashtag recivilization. So there are many ways you could uh, participate. Um, if you have a question... Uh, for uh, Mr. Tapscott, we'd love to hear. But let me ask the first question. What do you mean by re-civilization? I thought we were already civilized. Well, we have a civilization, and it's the civilization of the Industrial Age. And that replaced the previous one, which was uh, an agrarian civilization based on a means of production and political system called feudalism. And... It was a revolution in communications and media that got us from the agrarian to the industrial capitalist model. And that, of course, was uh, Johannes Gutenberg's great invention. And prior to that, people didn't have knowledge. Knowledge was concentrated in tiny oligopolies, and uh, there was no concept of progress. You lived your life, and, and you died, and that was it. Uh, along comes a printing press, knowledge becomes more broadly distributed, and the institutions of feudal agrarian society began to appear to be stalled or frozen or failing or in atrophy. And it didn't make sense for, uh, for the church to be in, in charge of medicine when people had knowledge. It didn't make sense for a bunch of kings and nobles to be running everything. So uh, we saw the big changes, the rise of parliamentary democracy, the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther called the printing press God's highest act of grace. Eventually, the industrial age, and it was good. It advanced our standard of living. And there's been a lot of talk about, you know, we're moving into some kind of post-industrial age. And I think the punctuation point in human history was 2008, that we saw the collapse of the financial system. And that was sort of the catalyst to to point out that all of these institutions, and there are 15 that we talk about, are in various stages of being stalled or frozen or even failing. So whether it's old media, uh, whether it's our models of the university, our models of the corporation, of innovation, of, of science, of our old models of the electrical power grid or how we cooperate globally, all of these are now not just failing, but you can see the contours of a whole new set of um, institutions that are emerging, and they're based on, on um, new principles and based on the Internet. So that's kind of uh, the, 
the, the Coles Notes version of the whole thing. <laughs> I didn't even know if Coles Notes still exist. They I did think, when I was at school. <laughs> I think we have we had Cliff Notes here in the States. Now, um, there is a typing sound coming from you, Don. I'm not sure if that's Cover It Live or you're just a very fast typist. But uh, No, it's... It's not me who's typing. Adam, is that you by any chance? It, or someone well, the else only not? sound that we're, we're, we're picking up is you. So um, it's coming from your computer. It might be cover it, the Cover It Live sound effect. Uh, I'm not sure uh, exactly what it is. Um, but it, it just so uh, people, well, people know that's coming from you. You don't have any headphones, do you, uh, Don? Uh Let's see. I, no, I don't have them okay. quite handy okay. now. It's our fault. When we uh, when we tested this, we should have uh, yeah. asked you to get some headphones on. So uh, there is a Cover It Live chat window, and uh, I believe there's a speaker icon at the bottom of that, and you can click that speaker icon to mute that sound. It's right there where next uh, underneath the send button. Um, if that's on, that would be... I think that's the sound we're hearing. Um, I'm on Skype. So, and I'm not typing. I don't know who that is. No, it's typing. a Cover It Live sound effect. So, uh, uh, if you you do you have Cover It Live open? Do you have the CBC window open? Um, on I'm Skype. Yeah, I'll find it right now. Yeah. Uh, and then you can mute that because <laughs> it's driving our chat room crazy, and that's all they want to talk about right now. Okay. <laughs> this is on the CBC. Hey, I've got headphones too. Does that help? That will that will also I think unless that the unless Skype is picking it up. The best thing to do at this point though would be to to mute the cover it live uh, sound effects because every time we get another uh, cover it live. Um, okay, in, I so can I'm see on... the chickity chick. I hear the chickity chick. Okay, I'm on the CBC site. What am I doing now? So you see that uh, uh, where it says join the live chat today. Below that is a window that says cover it live. And uh, in, in that window, the Cover It Live window, at the very bottom there, underneath Send, there's a series of icons. You want, this is the chickity chick sound icon. You want to make sure that that is muted. Join the live chat, follow. What, way down below in the Cover It Live uh, yeah, I don't have a covered live thing. Hmm. Well, why don't you close that CBC window? That'll help. Yeah, it wasn't even open, actually. Uh, uh, maybe I'll just quit Firefox. So what the yeah, that's probably a good idea. Well, I've revealed what browser I'm using now. <laughs> that's all right. People know People know what I use, too. <laughs> it's quite all right. Okay, well, I'm, I'm off. I'm just on Skype now. So. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that, Don. Sorry about the little technical uh, interruption. We just uh, we don't want to distract people uh, with that chickity chicking going on all the time. Uh, so uh, a comment from Christopher. Government is one of many organizations that hasn't changed much in over a century. Don, where do you see democracies changing over the next 10 years? Well, it's a great question. And I think that we had a first era of democracy that did come out of this industrial age. And we set up these representative institutions, and they were a good idea. Uh, you know, Ross Perot used to talk about the electronic town hall. You get to vote every night on the evening news. That would be a bad idea, a.k.a. the electronic mob. Uh, democracy is a lot more than majority rule on a nightly basis. One of the things it's about is protecting the rights of minorities. But in the first era, we had there was a, a, a weak public... Uh, uh, a representation and citizens were inert and now we can move to a whole new model of democracy i think that's based on a culture of public deliberation and and of active citizenship so you know obama changed the way you win elections but he didn't fundamentally change the way that you rule we still have the industrial age you vote i rule model and now if you look at the election shaping up in the u.s it's it's pretty bad because uh Young people are now, because they haven't been engaged in government, they're now pretty cynical about the whole thing. We know that they care a lot. They have very strong values. They're a huge generation. But all of the evidence is that youth voting is down and that young people are looking for extra, extra governmental ways of achieving social change. And to me, Occupy is just the tip of the iceberg on that. So, uh, you know, Obama did some things, 
but he, he sh right now he should launch a digital brainstorm. Why don't we have a three-day conversation of everybody in America on, on a topic like how to create jobs? Um, he's done some challenges. The Department of Education has been very good in that regard. Uh, he had held an electronic town hall meeting, but he didn't curate it very well. Um, the purpose of these is not to tell governments what to do. It's to have real discussions. And, of course, he let people vote. It turns out the number one issue facing America is the legalization of marijuana, you know, after everyone voted. So, um, on the other hand, maybe, the, you know, maybe if you think about how drugs are at the heart of terrorism and all kinds of other big problems in the society, maybe the legal is it. Maybe they were. Maybe, maybe it is important. <laughs> it does. It does. Uh, well, it underscores a couple of things. We had Clay Johnson uh, on uh, a couple of weeks ago. He wrote a has written a book called Information Diet, but he was in, responsible uh, for President uh, Obama, then candidate Obama's uh, digital initiatives. And he said and I asked him the question, how is it that you had such a uh, wired campaign and then you got to the White House and it was back to the 19th century? And uh, he said, well, because the White House is essentially stuck in the 19th century, he said. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it, what it shows is, it's, it, first of all, institutions move slowly. And so bringing in the technology, and I think they have been doing that over the last four years, to, to, to bring uh, transparency into government, interactivity into government, to, to bring the conversation into government, takes a while to implement. Uh, I do believe that they're trying to implement it. Um, and the other issue is, a, is an issue that we all face, which is, uh, you know, when President Obama did that Google Hangout, um, it was very controlled because it has to be. You can't have a million people all in a single conversation. How do you, in a in a mass democracy, I mean, I think in the U.S. the founders realized this. That's why we have a representative democracy. In a true mass democracy, doesn't the conversation become fragmented and suddenly all you've got is petitions for marijuana legalization? Yeah, if that's the model that you have, it's a big mess. But as it turns out, in a digital brainstorm, it's not one big conversation. There are typically all kinds of different subgroups that are talking about things. You know, IBM had one in, um, with its own employees and their families, and I was involved in that, actually. They invited some other people. There were 400,000 people over a three-day period. So if you can have 400,000, it's not a fundamental, fundamentally big change to have 4 million. Um, South Africa is the first country, actually, ironically, because of the digital divide, that's had one of these digital brainstorms at the level of a country as a whole. So, yeah, don't get me wrong. I, I, we have representative democracy for, for good reasons. But citizens have been inert. You know, it's like I'm a politician. Yeah. Listen to this negative ad and uh, where I attack my opponents around issues that you could care less about if you're a young person, and then go vote for me, and I'm going to broadcast to you for four years, and then we get to do it over again. Right. No wonder young people are not engaged. And, and just on the point about um, Obama's campaign, I mean, I, I've been, I'm, I'm going to write a piece about this. I've been interviewing uh, some people who were very active in the original campaign uh, three years ago, almost four years ago, and um, they're saying that that now that he's running again, even the model of campaigning has changed. Like you used to be able to go on mybarackobama.com and create a, a new community. But now you, you can. It's all much more tightly controlled. Now the argument, of course, is that, well, the incumbent, and pres the incumbent president needs to control things uh, a lot more tightly. But that's a, I think that's a big mistake. And he's got to like open up and reach out. Uh, and engage people like he did the first time around, or, or it's going to be a real difficult ride. Michael Cillian in the uh, Cover It Live chat raises that very issue. He says, how desperate and defensive will the people that sit in power now be to hold on to it? Will they be able to flow with a changing world? It, it really does seem like once once you win the election, then it's like, okay, now shut up, everybody. I'm in charge here. Well, that's on the surface, that's what... It kind of looks like that happened. Yeah. Now, we can cut him a little bit of slack. He did uh, do a big open uh, gov initiative and in trying to release all kinds of government data. And he did make a few engagement uh, efforts. But it's been pretty much a traditional 
kind of presidency. The first internet president, turns out it was the first internet campaigner, but not necessarily the first internet president. And weirdly, the organization today that's using the internet most powerfully to uh, harness the power of self-organization is the Tea Party. Interesting. Um, is it always going to be the People's Rebellion? That's a populist movement, isn't it? Uh, that ultimately uses these new tools? Uh, and and does that mean entrenched power will never use these new tools? Will we never have transparent government? Because government fundamentally doesn't want to be transparent? Well, I, I think that they're going to have to be. Because um, there's a real uh, danger of, the, of government's losing their legitimacy. And, uh, you know, as you start to get a minority of the population voting and young people, a tiny minority of them voting, and they represent the future, they're the biggest generation ever, um, there's a real problem that's shaping up here. And, you know, thinking about it, it's really weird that half of the world is clamoring for democracy. Right now in Syria, kids are being right. killed as we speak right. in the streets because they want democracy. But where democracy exists... It's really largely in these, uh, you know, OECD uh, countries, 30 countries or so, where it's become fossilized and where it's become a, 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 a shadow of its former self and, and what it could be. I mean, you know, that little uh, stereotype that I just uh, made about elections in the U.S. is actually worse than that because, you know, I'm a politician, you're like me. It's not just that I'm going to broadcast you for four years because actually the main thing I'm going to do in the next four years is going to take 75% of my time is to raise money. Right. And I'm going to raise money from powerful people and interest right. groups. And, and you can guess how I'm going to behave. Um, because after all, if I don't vote and raise money, I won't be able to be elected and to represent <laughs> you again. You know? It's a vicious circle. Let's uh, move from government to uh, education. Uh, Recivilization also uh, uh, changes the way education works. We have a very top-down education system right now. The professor lectures, you listen, you regurgitate the uh, information the lecture uh, gave you uh, accurately, you'll get an A. What, 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 what does it look like in the recivilized world? Well, again, it's the same industrial model, and I think you described it well, Leo. You know, I'm a I'm a lecturer, I'm a teacher, I have knowledge, or a student, you don't. You're an empty vessel, get ready, here it comes. Yeah, I'll fill you up and, and regurgitate properly, you win. Yeah, your goal is to take <laughs> it into active working memory and through practice and repetition to build be deeper cognitive structures where you can recall it when I, I test you, <laughs> drill and pill. Right. You know, sage on the stage. You, to me, the lecture is the process whereby the notes of a lecture go to the notes of a student <laughs> without going to the brains of either. And, and I love that. You know what? <laughs> Kids are boycotting it. Yeah, the they don't like it. Yeah. in the United States don't go to lectures. The big thing is to get an A because the, uh, without having ever gone to the well, It's easy to game the, it. The that's a system that's easy yeah. to game if that's the system. Yeah. Now, let's be fair because I think good teachers and good professors uh, in every uh, walk of life are trying to teach people to think for themselves. Um, aren't they? Sure, of course they are. But the problem is when you've got a thousand people in the Psych 101 class and you're the lecturer, the only modus operandi is a broadcast one. I mean, maybe a half a dozen kids can ask questions, but the student is isolated in the learning process. It's a one way, one size fits all uh, focused model. So how do we fix this and, and what do we move to? First of all, don't get me wrong. I'm not a proponent of, quote, online education. I think the computers are important in the new model um, as our networks, but it's not about the technology. It's about changing the relationship between the student and the teacher and the learning process. And if anything, the teacher becomes way more important because, say, a statistics class, uh, the statistics lecture by definition is a bust. I mean, there's no one size fits all for statistics. Everyone in the classroom is either bored or else they don't get it. So there should be no statistics lectures. Young people should learn statistics through two things. One is through interactive self-paced com uh, uh, computer programs where you can go over things you don't understand, you go through things you do understand quickly, you can test yourself, you can do a side, you can go into other related areas. That plus face-to-face -face small group learning. 
And if we can free up the prof from being a transmitter of data, then that prof can focus on customizing uh, learning experiences for young people. And when you do this, you just get better learning performance. You get kids who like learning more. You get kids who uh, score higher on standardized statistics tests. And this is true for just about every subject. Now, every, every subject is different in some ways. The best way to study Shakespeare is to act it. Um, but the, the old industrial model was based on scale, it was based on standardization, and it viewed the students as sort of units of production, right? And we can now do better than that. And it just kills me, you know, well, we don't have the technology to do this, to reinvent our schools, our universities. I mean, um, uh, 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 we don't have the money. And yeah, we got the money for bank workers to use technology and for government employees to have technology. We don't have money for our, our, our kids to have their birthright, which is access to the learning revolution of their time. We, and we, we do a great disservice to, to our, not just to young people, but to ourselves. Some comments from our uh, Cover It uh, Live chat room. And I really appreciate the engagement there uh, from uh, our listeners and viewers at uh, cbc.ca slash recivilization. Um, Jeff X re said, refers to MIT X for innovation and education. In fact, in your, uh, your, your show about this topic, which was called, I think, Open yeah. Source Knowledge, you did have a couple of people from MIT's Open Courseware Initiative. And they, they, among others, and many universities, are really engaging online learning uh, in some, I think, great ways. Um, Dale Send says, regarding education, I've been retired for 15 years, but our school was not hierarchical, a very small school system, no middle management. Teachers wrote the curriculum. The principal was willing to back teachers who innovated, even if it failed. It worked, and it was fun. Uh, to which well, he's lucky... He was lucky, lucky wasn't he? Kids, and, yeah. yeah, those kids were lucky too, but yeah. that's not the model, unfortunately. Well, and that's what David's point is. The old schoolhouse mentality was great when one's world only encompassed their community, but now our community is global and education needs to change. We have in, today information now. We should teach today information now. Um, yeah. And uh, finally, uh, Scott says, that's why I'm a Trent student. He says, getting lost in a lecture hall full of a thousand people doesn't do students any favors. Let's move from education uh, to work because uh, most of us will spend most of our lives working. And a, given that we are in a post-industrial age, a surprisingly large number of our workplaces are essentially industrial era, aren't they? Well, pretty much. By the way, Trent University is a small Canadian a university. It's a liberal arts school. It's trying to be like a Williams or Amherst, only without the massive endowment. And um, but uh, that's where I went to school, undergraduate. Oh, that's neat. My son, and to your point, Leo, my, my son went to Amherst, and uh, the student ratio, teacher-faculty ratio of uh, eight to one. So you don't really need technology, right? You know, in a history class when you got a teacher and eight kids sitting around the table. So it's all about creating a custom collaborative model of learning. Uh, when it comes to uh, the corp, and, and by the way, on the MIT thing, yeah, the main thing f for me about the MIT's Open Courseware Initiative is not just that they put all this course material online so some kid in, you know, Mumbai can learn how to program, which is a wonderful thing. The main thing is that how weird that there are, 10,000, I don't know, 20,000 uh, mathematics professors each developing their own little courseware and notes and PowerPoints and tests and software to uh, help kids learn calculus. I mean, there are probably about three best ways of learning certain elements of, of, of calculus. And they're different according to different cultures. So what we should be doing, I think, is... But we should be cooperating. And that's the power of the MIT thing is that that first you place it online and then faculty can start to cooperate in the co-creation and co-development of real uh, world-class uh, materials. In terms of the corporation, huge change is underway. Uh, one is that the industrial age corporation was vertically integrated. It did everything from soup to nuts. And the effect of the Internet is to drop transaction and collaboration costs so that peers 
can now come together and create value. And within an organization, companies acting as peers and also um, peers in the sense of companies outside the boundaries of organizations or, and people outside the boundaries of traditional companies acting as peers. So that's what we have with you know, Linux and Wikipedia and all kinds of other initiatives where these vast pools of labor can create value or Innocentive that has a, th a million chemists available uh, for Procter & Gamble to, uh, to tap into when they're trying to find some new uh, molecule. So that's a huge change that's uh, underway. We've also got changes in terms of what is management and how management works, that the old industrial age model, again, it was a sort of broadcast model. I'm your boss. I'm an authority on everything in this business unit. Um, and here's what I'd like you to do. And uh, I can always spot that culture in a second if I walk into some, you know, executive office or boardroom. People use language that in, in, encodes all of that, like, uh, you know, my people. He's one of my people. Right. So like, I own this person. Right. <laughs> so th these are big changes in innovation, big changes in production. You can say what you like about the 787 Dreamliner and it had some problems, but aircraft will never be built or produced the old way. That thing was a total breakthrough, it, and it was the first time anyone tried it. How do you d design an airplane without a spec, where you bring in all of your, your ecosystem to do the design? The 787 Dreamliner, uh, when you're flying at, at uh, 36,000 feet, it'll affect your body as if you're at 1,500 and feel like that. And it uses 25% less fuel than its competitors. So that's called competitive advantage from a new networked, uh, business model as opposed to an old industrial age yeah. model. Yeah. We're talking to Don Tapscott. He's the author of uh, most famously uh, Wikinomics, uh, Growing Up Digital, Grown Up Digital. His most recent is Macro Wikinomics. And uh, he's been producing for the uh, CBC a radio program called Recivilization. Four episodes so far and a fifth uh, to come. You can find out more at cbc.ca slash recivilization. And there's a podcast there, so you can automatically uh, get the audio of these shows and listen to it. And I highly recommend it. Each of them is kind of an eye-opener and some really amazing. You've got great interviews with people like Reed Hoffman talking about the future of uh, work. Um, people uh, like uh, John Seeley Brown talking about the future of education. Um, Tim Berners-Lee is uh, coming up. Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He was also in the first uh, episode. Um, highly recommend the show. And uh, I'm glad that you could join us for a, a sh It's a way too short conversation this morning. Uh, maybe we should do this um, more often, Don. Let me let me wrap it up, though, with a, with a final question, uh, which is really a kind of an action item for people who are listening. Uh, I think we all understand that we're making this transition from an industrial era to an era of networked intelligence. We all feel it. Um, we all want our institutions, our government, our health care, our education, our work to reflect it, but very often uh, it does not. Is there anything that you know we as students, as educators, as workers, as employers can do, uh, as, uh, as the governed and the governing can do to uh, hasten this transition, or is it just going to happen? Well, no. Uh, the future won't just happen. It'll be created. And... Um, and I'm not into predicting the future either. I think the future is something to be achieved. And we all need to get involved. Uh, there's a crisis of leadership when you get an historic change like this. And these transitions, if we can learn anything from history, are often very difficult. I mean, from agrarian feudalism to industrial capitalism, that was the midwife was revolution. French, Revolution, American. I was just in Latin America. I saw a statue of Bolivar, the National Democratic Revolutions all across Latin America. And uh, you look at, at what's happening today with the Arab Spring and Occupy. This is the tip of the iceberg, Leo. I'm convinced we're moving into a period where there's going to be massive dislocation, conflict, um, and violence. And the only way that we can avoid a big mess is for people in their institutions and outside them to get involved. So if you're a student, get involved. Talk to your statistics prof about wouldn't it be great to, uh, to develop some interactive routines and acquire them to do this. Um, 
uh, approach your legislators and, and uh, people in government and demand that, that they engage you. Um, you know, reach out if you're in the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. You've got to fundamentally rethink your whole model of how you do research. Otherwise, that industry is going to collapse. It's going to lose a quarter of its revenue over the next year. And if we stop developing medications um, and medicines, this is a big problem for humanity. We've got huge issues, you know, climate change. Our, our, our nation states and their global institutions can't seem to come up with an agreement on this problem. So, you, you know, if you're an architect, join in the discussions online about how to retrofit old buildings. So you're a student, uh, get involved in your schoolyard with other with initiatives um, uh, like that. You're a, you're a, a lawyer. Think about uh, new, model, new models of legislation and law that can, that can help move this forward. And basically, this is an age of participation where we all need to get involved. And if we do that, then maybe this age of networked intelligence will be an age where the promise is fulfilled and where the peril is unrequited. I think you're right. It's up to us, isn't it? And uh, and the last thing we want is uh, a violent revolution. We can make this happen now uh, if we're proactive. Thank you, Don, for joining us. I encourage everybody to uh, listen to the show. It's just fantastic. Recivilization with Don Tapscott. A five-part series. Four parts are already up at cbc.ca slash recivilization. And uh, more to come soon, I know. Um, when's the next uh, episode come out? Pretty soon, right? Yeah, Sunday, uh, Sunday morning. Awesome. So 10 o'clock Eastern time, it'll be up um, and it'll be streamed. And you can also uh, podcast it later on in the day. It's going to be interesting to see what's after that. Yeah. I need some advice from broadcasters like you. <laughs> I like it that you're doing this. Uh, and we thank everybody who joined us in our Cover It Live chat, our IRC chat online on Twitter. Um, a great conversation and just just way too short. So I, my suggestion, Don, is that we do this again. Well, it's always a pleasure, Leo. Thank you, Don Tapscott. Great to talk to you. He's at D Tapscott on Twitter, and the conversation, I'm sure, will continue uh, there. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.